I'm going to let our clinicians introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Cindy Lansford. We'll go to Ms. Bain and then to Mr. Russell. <laughs> okay, I'm Cindy Lansford, and I'm the oldest person on this screen. I am 99.9% .9 sure. Um, I'm even older than Daryl. I see you, Daryl. <laughs> um, and um, so, okay, so I started teaching in 1976, way before most of you were born or even thought of. And um, I taught for 30 years, um, both high school and middle school, but mostly middle school, and um, had... Uh, which is, I think is really good for this topic tonight because I had huge band programs, some that started small and got bigger, but um, nevertheless, lots of kids. And um, then I retired and I do consultant work. And if you're not from Texas, uh, we have this wonderful thing where retired people um, get to go and visit different band programs. So I go to between 25 and 30 schools um, each year about five to six times and work with, um, I call it um, mentor, you know, teacher mentor and consultant type thing and work with people, mainly work with the teachers, but also get to be around the kids and everything. And so that's what I do now. And um, it's really fun. I get to be around a lot of smart young people and I get to meet, uh, you know, uh, lots of new people doing this and um, kind of stay in touch, you know, with what's going on in the band world. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, Ms. Bain. Okay, great. Hey guys, it's an honor to be with everyone tonight. I teach outside of Birmingham, Alabama in a school system called Vestavia Hills. I'm at Pizitz, P-I-Z-I-T-Z, -I -I Pizitz Middle School. Wow. I was just telling Cindy and everyone, we are moving to a new building this fall and I spent the last three days packing my band room. So I'm a little tired, but it's good to be here talking band. But I have taught in so many different settings. This is um, fun for me to be sharing some thoughts with you. My first job was in a rural setting in Ravenna, Ohio. I did some graduate school at Bowling Green State University and got a teaching position up there first. And then I made it my way back home and I've been at different types of systems. And my program at Pizitz, we were fortunate enough to make the Midwest in 2015, my bucket list check mark there. And uh, we played some conferences around the Southeast and done music for all. And uh, um, like I said, this is gonna be year 29 for me. And I just, I guess it's a good sign that it doesn't feel like 29 years. It, it feels like I'm still, I don't know, I'm still having fun. So that's a good thing. So it's great to be here. All right, Mr. Russell. Hi, uh, my name is Marquise Russell. I'm the uh, band director and lead music educator at Nicholas Senn High School in Chicago. We are part of the um, Chicago public school system. A interesting fact about the Chicago public school system is that a majority of the uh, band directors at the high school level um, start their students on their instruments in ninth grade. Um, I can probably count on one hand the number of elementary programs that are in the city of Chicago. And if there are programs at the elementary level that are in existence, they're usually programs where an outside agency comes into the building and offers band for a half hour a week, um, which I consider to be instrumental exposure. So really when we're getting kids in high school, they're starting on their instruments for the very first time. When I first got to uh, Nicholas Senn High School four years ago, um, we had 22 students in the band program. Today we have over 137 and are set to have closer to 200 um, this upcoming fall. So it's just been a really great journey building the program and taking students from where they are as freshmen and then their senior year, watching them get accepted into colleges and universities. Some students are going on to study music education and some are going you know, to universities to study, study other things. And it's really exciting to see that they're finally getting that return on their investment that I preach so much about um, their freshman year. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's let's jump into the questions, folks. If you have questions uh, at any point, you can drop them in the chat, uh, and I'll do my best to get them to the clinicians. We will have a Q and A portion at the end, um, uh, but I guess we're gonna start with our leadoff hitter, uh, as she's already been doing for us. So we're gonna start kind of broad and kind of zoom in. So Cindy, you know your number's getting called. Um, yeah. But why should why should a kid join band? Um, okay. 
So I, he told me that this was going to be my question. And so really what I want to say to you is what I told fifth graders, why they should be in band. Um, because I think we all know why we think that kids should be in band. I mean, all the benefits, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I think we're fooling ourselves if we think that they join band for the musical experience because you know there's a million other things that they join it for but this is the approach that i would take whenever i am standing in front of a bunch of fifth graders why should you be in band because the best kids in the school were in band and you know we're uh good people and when you're coming from the elementary school you want to um you know, surround yourself. You want to be a part of a group when you get to the middle school because it was so much bigger and, you know, scarier and all that kind of stuff than um, elementary. And this, these are the best people in the school. And I always really tried to highlight um, my students' achievements, not just in band, but academically, um, athletically, in every way. And um, really, uh, you know, felt like that that was actually, I see one of my former students right there. Um, so, uh, but you know, I, I think that you, um, you promote your program and you get kids to join your band and your program when you promote your students, your individuals, and not all the bells and whistles and all the other things, you know, because this is a group that you need to be a part of. We're good for you, You're, you'll you be good for us too. And um, so anyway, that's why I think kids should be in band because I think band kids or the kids that were in the band hall, those are the best kids to be around. And it was just, it was a healthy atmosphere. And that's what I really preached was the whole healthy atmosphere. So that's why I think kids should be in band. <laughs> that's great. I, that's so funny because we say a lot of the same things, Sandy. We talk about how uh, we have real fun in band, that there's fake fun and real fun. And our fun does require some work. But if you're willing to put forth a little bit of work, you're gonna be around all your friends and have a ton of fun in the process. We do talk a lot about um, our kids are on the math team and our kids yeah. are on, they play football and our kids are on the basketball team and the girls volleyball team. We really, um, at my school, we try to push the fact that our students are involved in many different activities at the school and not just band. You know, um, one of the coolest things are, any of you guys a member of that band directors group that's on Facebook? Oh yeah. Okay, so before, and I went back and looked at the picture before all of the craziness started in March, there was a school and I wanna say it was in Louisiana and she made like a poster or a picture of her kids in all of their different, um, I'm gonna say outfits, but that's the wrong uh, word, uniforms for all the different activities. Mm -hmm. And it was a really informal picture and they had their band, you know, their band instruments. Mm -hmm. And there was somebody in a tutu because they were a ballet kid. Then there were kids in their basketball uniforms, mm -hmm. volleyball, you know, one thing I thought, okay, why didn't I not think of that? That's just so great. That highlights all of the different things um that you can do and why this is the place that you should you need to be look at all the different great people that are in band so i just thought that was the best thing ever it's really good it really is and uh speaking of of doing more things like besides band being a part of the math team being a part of the sports it takes a certain level of communication between the directors and the coaches and i'm not saying that that's where this question should go uh, Kim, but how important is communication in regards to recruiting and retention, and how, how often does that occur for you? Well, um, as we say, as my principal says in my building, communication is key. Uh, you really have to have a plan uh, for your recruiting, and you have to know who you need to be communicating with, and I think one of the biggest resources that Leah, my assistant, we, we use is we work through our, our elementary school music teachers. Uh, we try to correspond with them quite a bit to coordinate recruiting opportunities for us. So that's one area of communication. Um, another one, of course, is the parents uh, of the rising sixth graders 
uh, the current fifth graders. We communicate with them, but we try, we don't want to inundate them too much in a normal recruiting season. We would um, reach out to those students who got black belt karate awards at the elementary school. We, re we send special letters recruiting those students and then uh, we communicate uh, with some information on our website. We also reach out uh, through the school counselors with um, a letter of information showing all the aspects of the band program at Pizzitz Middle School, what their child would have to look forward to. We try to inform the parent so we communicate with the parents so they can make an educated decision about what elective is best for their child. Uh, and you can't wait to get after that. I mean, you're going you're gonna to have to get on with business pretty early in the school year. I make myself available, not in any formal way, but I always get permission to just be present at a PTO meeting at the elementary school. I'm just there. And, um, you know, the principal will make an announcement or the president, will, well, you know, Miss Bang from the Pazitz Band is here if you have any questions. And it's very informal. I just hang out at one of their early, you know, probably November um, or around a meeting around that time. I just want to be there in case they have questions and maybe have a little propaganda to pass out just in case that I'm allowed to do that. And um, I also communicate through my students. I use my my band current band students as big means of communication we have all <laughs> we are always um dangling carrots in my band program but we uh have a we have opportunities for donuts so like if you if you talk to fifth graders about the Pazitz band program and you can show us uh names of five students that you recruited for us you could come to the donut party uh, so we do silly stuff like that, but hey, um, your band kids can be great ambassadors for you. And so, they are the best ones, honestly. Oh, they are. Yeah, because kids moms. don't care what uh, old people think. I mean, they want to know what their friends that are just one year older think. Yeah. So uh, you really need to take advantage of that. Let's see, I'm trying to think of other means of communication. Uh, I We've always, in a normal year, we, we would invite fifth grade, we have special seating on the spring concert for rising sixth graders. Uh, they can come sit in a certain area, we kind of rope it off and, and do special things if they want to come to our spring concert. Um, just really think about all those stakeholders, the, the rising sixth grade parent, your elementary music person, your PTO at your elementary school, all those people that can impact your numbers and, and your chance for success. I guess I'll end it there. Yeah, it's a really broad question. And so I, I thought you did a good job of, of nailing that down. And we're gonna shift gears a little bit. And Marquise, this is for you. Um, and Marquise alluded to earlier, you know, he grew his program from 22 kids to 200 in right at four years. Uh, and what's so unique about that, what I find pretty incredible is it went from, or he's doing it with three different, uh, three different schools, if you will, inside of a school. So he's working with three different sets of schedules. Uh, so yeah. I know that takes some level of communication with your administration, Marquise. So what, or how can you work, or how have you worked with your administration to benefit your band program? Well, um, for me, when I first interviewed at Seton High School, and you know, you get to that portion where they say, "Well, do you have any questions for us?" I asked my principal, "Well, what do you think, or what do you feel is the role of a band program in a school?" And the answer to that question for me would have determined if I would stay where I am teaching choir, or if I would come to the school and try to build a um, band program. Um, you know, part of the story. I'm still there building the band program. Um, her answer was, well, I want this to look, feel, and sound like an art school. And, you know, when she said that, I, I was sold. Um, but I was also walking into a situation where, you know, the entire music faculty had quit the year before. And, you know, myself, the choral director and the orchestra director were coming in brand new. And in addition to trying to keep, you know, the culture of the program together, we were also looking at how are we going to continue building? And one thing that you know was very important to me was the idea of access and the idea of equity. And you know, 
the, our district and our school and our administrators kept throwing around the term equity and equity, equity, and people were talking about excess. So I, you know, realized that, okay, the reason that we have 22 students in the band program is because we have three populations of students. We have our IB students, we have our fine arts students, and we have our regular neighborhood students. Our regular neighborhood students happen to be predominantly minority students. And our art students are our students who audition into the program. And as I mentioned before, we don't have many schools in the Chicago public school system at the elementary level that have band programs and orchestra programs. So what are we auditioning? You know, um, so I started looking at examples of schools in the Chicago public school system at the high school level that were offering band for beginners at the ninth grade level. And, you know, anytime I'm communicating with my administrators, I like to bring them numbers. I like to bring them multiple examples of things. Um, so I brought, you know, four or five different examples of schools that were successful in offering band to the ninth grade level. And, you know, I brought in the statistics about how many students from the Chicago Public School District are making, you know, making it to our all state ensembles versus you know, students in the neighboring suburban schools. And, you know, what it came down to was it was an access and equity issue. And in order for us to offer ninth grade band, we had to look at the scheduling for our IB students and also look at the scheduling for our neighborhood students. And a lot of that required some changing in the master schedule of the school and also some changes in when the students could take their um, world language requirement. Um, so being willing to have those conversations, having the data to back it up, but also aligning your vision to the administrative goals for the school. Um, an administrator is focused on school improvement and, you know, things of that nature. So how does your, um, how does your band program align with the goals of the school? You know, our, one of our goals is to improve community relations. Well, Band program is a great way to do that. It's really hard to get out into the community and do impressive things when we have 22 kids, you know, in the band program. Or another goal is to promote equity and access. And, you know, we went one-to-one -one with Chromebooks and that was like the, you know, the big thing at our school. But, you know, in my perspective, buying computers wasn't gonna cut it. We have to give students opportunities. You know, a big part of my philosophy as an educator is to provide as many students as possible with as many opportunities to be the very best they can be and have a well-rounded experience and to get that return on their investment when they get to college because a lot of my students are from low-income families and would not have the opportunity nor would they have the financial means to attend college without scholarship money and you know with all of that i've been able to have these conversations with my administration and i've sat on um, at the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools Advisory Council, and I've worked very closely with our Department of Arts Education and Central Office, you know, really engaging all those stakeholders to try to get, you know, access to ensembles for students. And here I am four years later. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of work with your administration, especially with the scheduling part that you said. I think that's critical to make sure your schedule allows for kids to, to be a part of the band. They can't join if their schedule doesn't allow for it. Exactly. Um, Cindy, you had said something earlier um, about achieving a healthy atmosphere within your band program. Can you tell us more about how you created a healthy atmosphere in your programs? Um, well, uh, okay. So um, the, I believe in teaching the whole child, not just the music part. And um, I know when I first went to Northridge, and that was the last school that I was, uh, that's where I retired from, um, the atmosphere was not very healthy. And probably the best musician that I had uh, that year, I only had six kids make all district, which wasn't very many. And the best one I had in, spent the last six weeks in uh, on the off campus thing because of poor behavior. So that first year, all I did was talk about you know, I can't teach you to be a good music musician until you're number one, a good person, a good student, a good citizen. Then we can talk about, you know, being a good musician. So I just think that you have to have all of those things in place and um, just teach the whole child. It's not, 
I mean, you can make them, you know, into good musicians, but if they're not good people, then who cares? I mean, I think we've all been um, to those um, either region bands or honor bands or all state bands where, you know, the kids are, uh, well, this is what I've always found. The best musicians are usually the best kids too, best people, um, but not always. And, you know, I just, I hate that. I think that they need to go hand in hand. They, you have to act right, you know, to be a part of that. And I do think that's one reason why the programs where I was, were they were always big because it was a safe place to be. And that becomes more important, you know, as we go on, you know, in our, our craziness. Um, but I just think that the kids loved being there and I think they loved being around each other. And, um, I, I think that we bred an atmosphere that it was um, okay to be successful, but it was also like, okay to make mistakes. And, you know, they're, they weren't going to get laughed at or, you know, anything like that. It was just a healthy place to be. And I, I think that's important. And I think it's more important as the years go on that you just have that, but you got to be a good person first, you know? Yeah. So. Can I tag on to that. Um, we have a, I think we still have the poster up that says great people make great music. And you give your students opportunities to show that um, that social growth. Uh, now, not everybody buys into the trip thing, but we've had a lot of success offering our students trips, spring trips and things like that. We give them opportunities. Like Cindy says, it's okay to mess up, but we want you to show us that you are a part of a culture that you take pride in. And we, I think it's all about offering them the kinds of opportunities that they can see. Uh, hey, that, that would be good for me if I get to do that. Like I have a leadership council. I mean, I'll be honest with you. They don't, they don't decide anything. <laughs> I decide everything. But I structured in such a way that the kids take great pride in, in being on the leadership council. And we talk, we make plans for, uh, parties and we make plans for trips and when the bands go into uh, an honor band we get the, that group to organize snacks it's just little stuff that they can really feel a sense of pride about and I think um, I just don't know that other extracurriculars or co-curricular opportunities can offer that the way band does I think we're unique and how we can offer this great training in this wonderful subject of music, but so many other things along with it. And yeah, just to piggyback off of what um, Ms. Bain was saying, that sense of pride is something that's very important and, and student voice is something that's very important to me as an educator, um, student voice and student choice. Um, the first day of school, you know, we get through the introductions and everything. One thing that I like to do is to have the students work in a collaborative um, fashion to create um, our classroom norms or professional community expectations, or whatever we decide to call them. I don't call them classroom rules because I say, you know, you guys are all a bunch of young grown folk and I want to respect that. So we're going to call them, you know, our room 425 um, professional learning community expectations. And then they come up with those types of things. Um, I allow the students to create rubrics um, based upon how they'll be assessed on their tests or quizzes or things like that. Um, allowing them to have a voice in those sorts of things and also guiding them to kind of where you want them to go with it really empowers them. And I think that sense of empowerment um, is what keeps them coming back. I, I can't think of any other course that the students are taking where they have that level of choice. Or I'll have the students say, okay, let's go to JW Pepper. You guys listen to some things, you know, grade three, grade four, we're gonna attempt to play a piece. I let the students um, pick one or two of the pieces for the concert and, you know, they, they vote on it. And, you know, I, I'm, student voice has just kind of been a big driver in what I do. Um, and it's something that I really value. And one of the threads that I've seen in a number of the panels that we've had here on the virtual band director conference is uh, student ownership to where the students feel that they're a part of, that this is an organization somewhere that they, they can come and be. And that, that's absolutely critical. Uh, one of the things that we had talked, uh, panelists that we had talked about before we started, uh, I, th I think Cindy brought this up, was talking about the retention 
from sixth grade to seventh grade and how that like the between the first two years of playing uh and that's a big and especially this year this year there is no yeah yeah, uh, you know with no spring concert with no you know spring trips for those of you who do that uh so what do you got what are y'all's thoughts on not having or or how to help during this time where we don't have those things well, I, um, you know, I was telling these guys before everybody else came on that um, as I have been doing my schedule for next year, I talked to some folks and had kind of heard that some people were having trouble with sixth graders dropping out. Um, and, you know, when you don't see them every day and, you know, you're doing that anyway. Um, and then some people were having no trouble. And so I try, you know, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it and see what the deal is. And those that were, um, not having trouble, uh, there were two in particular, it was kind of a different approach uh, for both of them. One of them, they said they just, they weren't doing a lot of assignments right now. So in other words, the kids weren't feeling like they had to, like they weren't working very hard right now. Okay, now that's a great program. So we'll see how that works out. The other one, they had already put their bands in their classes for next year. And so they were kind of meeting in their next year's classes. Now, I'm going to be honest, I, did, I forgot to ask what he was doing with his eighth graders. Um, but, uh, you know, they were having, he goes, no, I'm not having any trouble. I said, well, good. And then the people that uh, were, felt like they were um, losing kids, I almost felt like they had been on a more structured, you know, this is your assignment, you know, body, body. And um, so, you know, get it turned in. So maybe almost too much. Now, listen, that's a generalization, you know, and I think all the rules are offered this year. I think that you keep them, you know, however you can this year. But I do think in a regular year, I think this is the most fun part of the year, of course, for uh, sixth graders, because it, it ends up being so different than the, you know, first uh, seven months have been, has been because they get to do the whole band experience and hopefully, you know, go to a little festival or, you know, something like that and, you know, do a big kid concert and um, it, it's, it's hard. And, and I just know that when you have those kids that are on the fence at this time of the year, this time of the year, it can, you know, say, okay, you know, we'll, let's give this a try. So anyway, but I, I think all bets are off this year. It's a crazy year. It is. It is. And you can probably talk to your administrators some and see if they could assist with this as well in that, uh, will they hold numbers for you? You know, I was, uh, somebody was talking, I think it was communication with the administration. And, you know, I just think you have to have a, most of the time, or at least where I'm from, the counselors do oh. everything. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a great relationship with that counselor, or an agreement that, you know, there needs to be communication. People don't just call and, you know, that's it. That there needs to be, you know, they need to give you the opportunity to communicate with the parent um, or to know about it before it's just all a done deal. And um, I, I don't really think that's changed. I, I still think that counselors are a big time deal important, so. And just to add on to that, um, something that's very important and it seems like it's being overlooked in a lot of programs right now is social media. I know there's not new content coming up now, but, you know, all of us have cool things that we've done, you know, even in the short amount of time we've been in school this year or, you know, last year, two years ago, you know, just consistently post. Um, the fine arts department at my school, we make the commitment to post to social media every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, we're on a schedule, you know, for example, Wednesday, myself and one of the theater teachers, we post on the social media. Um, it's important that people know that we're still here, we're still a community, we're still educating, you know, we can't afford for it to be all bets off or we can't afford for, you know, everything to come to a screeching halt because we're in the middle of a pandemic. You know, we're still a community and that's really important to um, have people acknowledge. Absolutely. And all great points, especially with, the, with what we're dealing with now. Um, but all of you, I want you to share with this, but uh, about this, but what hurdles have you faced uh, when recruiting students? Kim, you go first this time. Oh, <laughs> uh, hurdles. Let's see. 
there's always the hurdle seemingly I get this question even though I, I describe it differently in all my um, information that I pass out about band I always get the guys saying well if I sign up for band I can't do sports that really is a big problem in the mind of a fifth grader and anything you can do uh, at least at my school they're able to do all of that um, when they uh, I'm initially recruiting them into the program I tried like we said earlier really helping them understand that it is possible to do band and do sports that that's a hurdle that I have to jump um, other hurdles let's see you have the high school credit thing. Do you guys have uh, classes for high school credit? Oh, uh, no, we don't. We, yeah. I don't think we have that yet. Mm -mm. I, I know that several uh, uh, schools in Texas have had this problem. And, you know, one thing that I ran into, and it's like the foreign language thing, and they'd have to take two years of foreign language to get yes. one high school credit. And yes. I was vocal, vocal against that because it just was destroying you know programs yes. and I know another thing that we're kind of running into and I, this might be more of a Metroplex thing I'm not really sure I see Dorina on here and I don't know if you guys have this down there but it's just um, the number of electives that are being offered now oh. you know in the good old days it was band choir maybe orchestra and then an elective rotation um, and now it's like this that and the other and that is you know it's ridiculous and unless you have a huge school then it depletes every program. And um, I know in uh, the, a very local school district for me, okay, get this, this was really not good. Um, in order to be in the, uh, well, there was a, they added theater, mm -hmm. but in order for you to be able to go on this New York trip uh -oh. that wasn't even associated to the school, mm -hmm. you had to be in that theater class. Uh. I was like, uh, nope, eh, not, you know, not. and I don't know, um, uh, how many of you guys have, um, because, uh, Kim, you were talking about some things earlier. I thought, Ooh, I couldn't have done that because in, I know in a lot of larger districts, there are guidelines mm -hmm. and you have to follow the guidelines. And, you know, um, I may have gotten my hand slapped once or twice and that's okay. Um, uh, but, I think guidelines are good for the band program. I think they're good for you, but I think they protect you also, you know, so you got to follow them. Yes, you have to follow them. And then everybody is, you know, I think it's equal, you know, uh, everybody is, is equally represented. But anyway, those, I didn't mean to get off subject, but those excessive electives have really cut into some of our really great band programs because, you know, some principal thinks that they need to be able to do everything. It's crazy. School photography and yeah. a million other things. Probably our largest hurdle is we, if we can keep them from sixth to seventh, we got them. They'll stay. I got I agree. Them. I agree. Uh, but that problem for me is them thinking that they've got to start their foreign language before they go to high school. That's our biggest hurdle. Yeah. Academic. And it is not the case. And, and you really need to educate yourself with your high school's curriculum and have a good grasp and understanding of the number of foreign language credits necessary yeah. for different. I don't know if you guys have different types of diplomas. We used to. And it used to be the case that it would be very beneficial for a middle schooler to go ahead and start that foreign language credit. That is no longer the case. What happens now is when they go to high school, they just end up taking Spanish two through four instead of one through three. It's, it's just not a problem to wait and start your foreign language in high school, but you better find a way to train the parents about that. Yeah, we kept running into like they'd encourage them to get this all out of the way, and then all of a sudden the seniors wouldn't have enough things to fill up their senior year, exactly. and they would, you know, be out of school at noon or something like that, which is right. ridiculous, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I it, I know one year, I, my last school, we were basically on a seven period day, and then for two years we went to an eight period day. Our band enrollment jumped by one hundred. It was ridiculous. Like we we were hanging from the ceiling, <laughs> we space to put everybody or to store the instruments or stuff like that. But because it allowed us to keep kids, because athletics was big at our at my school, 
it was band and athletics, I would say were probably the two biggest things. Would you agree with that, Colin? Thumbs up? Yes. <laughs> and, um, and then this foreign language thing. And I mean, I did have smart kids and I was happy for them to be able to take that. Um, but it was, you know, I, I fought tooth and nail and the French teacher and I didn't get along all that well because of that. But anyway, um, but okay. he didn't really like anybody, so it was okay. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, I was just going to be honest with it. And, um, you know, I just, I, I do think, I think you have to keep your administration informed. I mean, everybody in the administration, you got to keep them informed. They have to be on your side or they have to at least be in your corner. You know, you said another thing about um, the communication and going to the elementary school. I'm so mad I didn't think about doing that. That was a great idea. But I did have a policy um, that if the door was open at my school, I was there. And I didn't really care what it was for, but if there was a PTA thing or if there was anything, because inevitably a question would come up that you needed to be there to give the correct answer for. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was fortunate. I lived five minutes from my school. It was easy for me to go home and, you know, run back. But I mean, you just have to be there, you know, to answer those questions. But that's a great idea to go to those elementary PTA things. So anyway. I agree wholeheartedly with that. And a piece of advice for everybody here is get, get involved outside of the band hall. Don't be the hermit that sits in your office and eats yeah. your lunch. Get out there. Get to know people. Most importantly, get on some committees. Have some influence in the master schedule of the school. Get on, you know, if it's a local school council or local school board, get on something, get involved, um, be involved in decision making because a schedule can make or break your program. Absolutely. I knew that was the case, you know, when I got to send high school, you know, we have, you know, three part, you know, three populations of students and one population of student can only do band their first year because sophomore year their schedule fills up well have some say so in okay. what happens you know with the master schedule that's that's crucial um my program would would have suffocated if i didn't start getting involved you know at the school level leadership early so get involved everybody Absolutely. And folks, I just open up the chat. So as you have questions, drop them in the chat uh, and we'll get to them as, as we go through our questions here. Uh, this question is a little bit more in depth. We've been pretty, pretty sky level. This is going to uh, really drop us down into uh, to a closer view. Um, but in band, you know, we don't want 75 saxophones, even though every kid wants to get a saxophone and play Careless Whisper. <laughs> and every child wants to play percussion and everybody wants to be the next little, you know, buddy rich. Sorry, Johnny, it's not happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. But how do we achieve or how do we strive to achieve proper instrumentation when it comes to instrument fitting? So we're looking at fifth graders. How do we get that to get to our right uh, instrumentation? Marquise, let's start with you because yours is a little different with your ninth grade. So how do you do that? So I, I do the instrument trial process, you know, within the first week of school, and I'm keeping in mind, you know, the instrumentation that I want for that particular section of beginning band, but I'm also keeping in mind the needs of the future ensembles. I'm looking at who's graduating in one year, two year, and also if this is a kid that I'm sure I'm going to be able to keep. I've managed to keep, you know, 97, 98% of my students, and I only lose students um, who are, you know, who are really, really having scheduling issues. Other than that, I don't lose students. Um, so I kind of just focus on those future needs, even if I have to sacrifice the instrumentation at the beginning band level. Oh, and, and this is a fact as well. I teach all of the instruments in the same class at the same time. So there's no separating. Old the school. That's the way we used to do it. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I was, I was at TBA, I think it was two summers ago, and I was telling someone, they were looking at me like I had four heads. But yeah, that's, that's the reality in Chicago. That's my normal. I don't know any other way of doing it. We do but. love your specialties in Texas, I tell you. You do. Y'all got it going on. Yeah, well. But, you know, the scheduling can become a real mess because, you know, I have 
um, students who have been playing for four years in with students that have been playing for two years. Um, I call it creative scheduling. You know, you, you send names or you recommend students for the course that you want them in. And it's like they put all the names into a hat and they shake them all up in the office and then they throw it. And then on the first day of school, you show up and you're surprised by what you get. Um, but, you know, regardless of that, I do the best that I can by the kids. Um, and that's the most important thing. And I always lead with that. Um, in an ideal world, I would be able to say, okay, make sure that these students get into this period. And sometimes the administration is able to accommodate. Sometimes they really are not able to, but you know, I'm not going to tell you know, my second year French horn player that she can't be in band because scheduling didn't work out. I'd say, okay, we're going to make this work for you. And, you know, I've been successful. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a unique situation um, in Chicago, but we're there for the kids and that's at the forefront of everything. Uh, I guess I'll blab a little bit about that. Um, we're closer to the Texas model. We're not quite there, but we're, we're trying. We have a woodwinds and percussion class, and then we have a brass, uh, excuse me, woodwinds and French horn class, and then we have a brass and percussion class. Uh, that was this past year. Prior to that, we just had everybody mixed together. Uh, but the way I try to hold instrumentation, and it's one of your biggest fights, and you've got to really take it seriously. It's one of my biggest concerns every year is after the kids, at, at the night of the fitting, after they tried out instruments, we have them make a first and a second choice, and we tell them that we will be in contact with them to let them know if they uh, receive their first choice or their second choice and that they are not to do any shopping until they hear back from us. And for my community, it depends on your community. I mean, I've taught in some places where a parent would just go, oh, we're going to do what we want to do. But I've been at where I am now long enough that the community has somewhat bought into what I'm trying to go for and they understand what we're about. And for the most part, they'll, they'll follow. I mean, there's always one or two crazy exceptions, but um, I've had good success with that system of just, they, they try the instruments, you tell them to write down their first and second choices based on their little trial, and then you're able to kind of fluctuate the numbers and work it to your advantage to some degree. Um, but you, of course you want the instrument that the child is best suited for, but at the same time, you and I both know we're, we're shooting for good instrumentation because it's going to impact your, your schools for, for seven years. years to come. Yeah, for years to come. Yeah, for seven years. So that's kind of um, Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to speak for all of Texas, but I think that most people, like if you have 150 beginners, then you set up what you want. You know, and as uh, Mr. Shroud, who was our music my most wonderful music supervisor said that's two 75 piece bands and then some people do individual um meetings you know with the parent and the student mm -hmm. um i always did an instrument fair and had different tables set up mm -hmm. uh and um you know that worked well for me because i would get the right recruiter on flute the right you know blah 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 and I was the greeter and would, um, they got to select three things. And, um, you know, the things, of course, we always had to control were saxophone and then double reeds. Um, and we always, well, we controlled everything, but, you know, percussion. So when they would leave there, though, unless they were a percussionist, they generally knew what they were going to play. And I think it doesn't really matter how you do it if you uh, of course this is an interesting year you know those that have already done their instrument fittings good for you those that haven't you know some people are like you know so, <laughs> yeah. you know we'll see how this is going to go but i i just think you have i think you need to try to be mindful of it and um we all have those parents who go well if it's drums or nothing and then yeah you know when i was strong i would go well then i guess it's nothing and m every once in a while i'd go and it, this is usually when i'd had an older student of there you know an older sibling i go okay and i mean i cannot think of one time when it really worked out so but you know 
sometimes you just can't tell them. And I, so I think you have to, you know, I think you just do the best you can. And um, it doesn't matter. We'll just see what happens this year. Now, evidently, there's some kind of kit that's come out that I think is now hard to get. Do y'all know about this? Then <laughs> you're checking your head. What do you know about this thing? Is it the Jupiter kit? Is it made yeah, by Jupiter? Jupiter kit. Hi, everybody. I'm Bennett Parsons. Um, yeah, the Jupiter kit, we uh, ordered that for our school district through Music and Arts. Um, and they were, when we started talking about it, they were supposed to arrive last Friday because um, we were originally going to start doing our petting, our instrument fair tomorrow. Um, you you we, go ahead and call it a petting zoo. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we pushed that back. So we're hoping to do that in July now. But um, when I talked to our music and arts rep, he said that, and this was as of last Monday, they were still in China, you know, getting put on a boat. Um, oh, so well, good luck with that. <laughs> No offense. No, no, yeah. We're, I we're mean, very, very well, listen, I'm just, I, I ordered a paint by number thing because, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands and it's set <laughs> in Shanghai for six weeks. And so I think it's about to get to Keller here after two months. Sorry, Mike. But yeah. I, it's going to be interesting on what to do. And I think a lot of people are just going to try to do it maybe at the beginning of the year, which I would hate that. Um, but, you know, I think you just have to do what you have to do, you know, this year. But, you know, people that go, oh, we let them play whatever. I'm thinking, well, you know, number one, that's not helping the kid. And, um, you know, you try to get them as close as you can um, to, uh, you know, what they need to be playing. And, you know, um, I was uh, talking to somebody the other day, and I have this perfect situation where, you know, we did really worked hard at getting our thing. And I had this one girl and I put her on flute. And I mean, after private lessons and six weeks and both of her parents are educators, she was on the wrong instrument. And I think you just have to be big enough to say, call the parent, go, we made a mistake. And the parent was like, oh, thank you so much for calling because she's tried so hard and it's terrible and put her on. And my student teacher that semester start, put her on clarinet and she was, you know, of course, great by the end of the, the first year. But, you know, it's just hard, but you've just got to, you just got to keep working at it. And, and I want to say one more thing about this. Um, uh, we have some schools uh, that have um, these, you know, uh, beginners on a different campus. And so the middle school director is not in charge of the beginners. And um, if it all works well, it's great. But if it doesn't, then you know, you get those kids in seventh grade. And if your instrumentation is not perfect, what should you do? Try to make it perfect. And even in high school too, um, you know, cause I know there are some high school teachers on here. If it's not right, you know, try to make a switch um, and put that trumpet player that's not right, put him on euphonium. He might make all state like a kid at Rouse High School did this year. You know, just he was just on the wrong instrument for all those years. And um, so anyway, sorry, I, I digress there. <laughs> I had a kid like that, started him on trumpet, actually played trumpet for two years and then tried him on trombone one day. And I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what have I done? But you know, it, it's okay because you know, now he's playing euphonium trombone and he's playing yeah. tuba now and he's gonna be going next year to Vandercook College of Music in Chicago to study music education. And Aren't you now, glad that you made that switch, though? Yes, yes. <laughs> never been, and it's okay for us to be wrong. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, it's an educated guess at best, so you do yeah. what you got to do. Absolutely, and we have a couple questions here. We got about eight minutes, folks, so if you have a question, you need to put it in that chat. We're going to do our best to get to it. Uh, this is a question that we could talk about for years, uh, but somebody asked, uh, they have students who are on the fence of getting out of band or, or excuse me, they want advice on students who are on the fence of, about getting out of band or saving students that are weary about high school band. So, okay. So what advice would you give to... Okay, so I'm going to, so since Marquise, you do high school, but you don't do marching band, mm -hmm. right? Right. Okay, so I'm going to guess this is may well i'm not it's not going to be a total marching band thing but you know that may have something to do with it and um kim what do you think about this i think kids are afraid of the unknown and a rising freshman 
has never marched before. So it's the great unknown for them. And that's those times where it would help you so much if you could get your high school directors in your band room to talk to those eighth graders. Well, I think, you know, listen, the more, that, and I know this doesn't happen everywhere, but the more that the high school people know the middle school kids, it is very difficult to say no to somebody that you know, but it's really easy to say no to somebody that you don't know. Exactly. And I, I actually saw that question and I, I felt like it was maybe, maybe I'm saying this wrong, um, it was somebody that was already in high school band and they're, they've grown weary of it. Mm -hmm. Is that what the question was yes, about? That's what it reads. That's what it reads. Yeah. Well, so, if some, I don't know. I mean, maybe a different role. I, I, I don't know. That's really hard because I, I, I would say maybe a little bit, you know, this is the hardest thing. Ask them what they're weary of. Yeah. You okay. know, but because sometimes it's the hardest thing in the world to hear the truth, but it's the best thing for you because they may not be the only one that's feeling that way. That's good advice. How many people do these surveys and everything? And I mean, I'm telling you right now, I would have been the last one in the world to do that, you know, <laughs> but it, um, you know, cause I, uh, my band program, it wasn't really, there was no democracy. It was pretty much a dictatorship. And I want to say something about that real quickly. Um, but, you know, I do think the surveys are really good. And even just sitting down and talking to that student, you may find something that you go, really me? You know, this is what really happens and who knows. But um, so uh, I was kind of interested in something that Marquis said earlier. Um, so after I retired, I got to go on one of these um, trips to Japan uh, that Keith Bearden and some people from Florida and I met some people from Arkansas that went and we went to an elementary, which is four, five, six, a junior high, seven, eight, nine, a high school, we went to a military band and everything. It was unbelievable. And I came away with two things. Number one, um, peer tutoring was fabulous. And I did not do it enough. And I had every opportunity to do it. I did it some. And I had every opportunity to do it. And I didn't do it. And I, it made me really mad at myself because I'd already retired by the time I went there. And number two, I was way too controlling. <laughs> and every Texas band director on here and probably some of the other ones, you know what I'm talking about. Because we are way, way, way too controlling. And a lot of times we don't give kids enough credit for the things that they know and um, the things that they're capable of. And Marquise, whenever you were talking about your kids being in the different classes, the first thing that came to my mind was peer tutoring, you know, and, you know, use whatever you can, you know, to do that. So anyway, it, it, it was really eye opening for me. Okay, I babbled enough. <laughs> All right, I have a specific question. This is addressed to Marquise. Oh boy. It says, what do you believe is the reason your numbers have grown so much compared to other programs in your area? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I always bring it back to the student centered environment that I try to create. It, it, that's what it comes down to. You know, the parents and the, the, and the students that are in the room with me every day are going to be the biggest advocates and the most important salespeople. Um, when they're somewhere where they feel like they have a say so and they feel like they have a voice because they do and they know that I value their opinion, whether it's me sending out a survey every few weeks to kind of do a temperature check or me allowing them to come to my office and tell me what it is that's really on their mind and then them seeing me actively working to make changes to make things better for them they pick up on that they notice that and you know they go and tell their friends you know um band is great you know if there's something that's not going well you know russell's gonna work hard to fix it and you know i i don't think there's ever been an issue that a student brought to me that i couldn't fix or come up with some solution where you know everyone feels like they have a chance to be successful so for me it, it comes down to the environment that i've work to build um, based around student voice um, and choice and equity. 
and I, I think that goes back to what Cindy was talking about at the beginning about talking about creating that healthy atmosphere and also Marquise, uh, the work that you did with your administration to make it possible for kids to sign up with Van. Uh, are you guys, we're at 728. Is it okay if we do two more questions? Is that okay? All right, we're gonna do two more and then we're gonna go home. Um, it's Taco Monday. Like I'm not <laughs> tacos. I don't know if that's the right acronym, but it's about to happen, so. Uh, <laughs> we alluded to this earlier, but let's see if we can go a little bit more in depth. Excuse me. Um, but what this is a question from Facebook, actually. It says, uh, what are your instrumental or trial processes when assigning new students their instrument? I guess I'll go first on that. Um, we in Alabama, we call it the horseshoe and the kids will come in. I'm at the greeting table, like Cindy mentioned, and they'll go from station to station. And I'm really careful about who I select uh, to help me do these instrument fittings because at the key. I'm telling you, it's it's not always your private teacher. Um, I agree, totally. It's totally. not. You've got to be really careful with who you get to do this. Um, this past year, we had 132 beginners. We had to do it all on a Saturday. So you've got to have folks that know what they're looking for and can do it in a really sweet and endearing way. They teach that little mini lesson and then the kid moves on to the next station and they try out the next instrument. Um, and then at the end of the process, the parent comes and sits down at a table with me and Leah and then we try to help, help them narrow it down to their top two. And then we say, you'll be hearing from us in July. Please don't shop until then. Here's some information. Uh, look out for an email for us but but who you get to do those selections you know i've had better success with retired directors than i have private teachers but i i still want the private teachers to come in during the school year and do the lessons for me but but the people who do that uh instrument fitting i've had much better luck with directors on that i agree i agree 100 percent on that and mm -hmm. um not even necessarily um somebody that it's their instrument Right. Um, but I we had a, a in Birdville, Tony Smith was a fabulous flute teacher, and he's a horn player. <laughs> and um, so for a couple of years, I just was not getting the right kids. And finally, I called and said, "Tony, I need you to come do my flutes." And yeah. he said, "I'll be there." You know, and we always helped each other out. So usually by February, we were all sick as a dog because we'd help each other out with these things. But um, you know, it absolutely makes all the difference in the world on who you get you know and it's those it's those pied pipers that'll bring them in and are astute and recognize um one of our uh, clarinet guys david burks who is a character he can pick a double reed player like nobody's business wow. now he teaches great double reed too but you know it's just it depends on the the personality i totally agree and actually ours was very similar to, to the way you did and you know like i said some people do the individual meetings some people do the you know kind of round robin thing and um it, it depends on what works for you in your situation but i do think it's all in who you get to you know bring them in there and you know it gets easier as you get older you can recognize that um you know this kid is not suited for horn or this kid is not suited for uh bassoon or you know whatever um and uh always the one that's the most difficult, you know, is saxophone because every, you know, <laughs> it's just hard. Everybody wants, it was really hard whenever Bill Clinton was president. I'm just telling you, not that it was even born then. Anyway, uh, it was hard. So anyway. So retired director all the way, get someone who's active. So Cindy, you're going to become the Chicago this upcoming year. <laughs> Listen, I know the way there for sure. Oh, Chicago. Hey, flights are cheap right now. Flights are real cheap. I know <laughs> they are. I'll just put that mask on and come on out. No problem. <laughs> awesome. We'll be in touch about that. There you go. Okay. One more question. All right. Last question. And folks, we're going to ask this question and we're going to get y'all out of here. Uh, do remember we have all of our videos posted up on YouTube or on our Facebook page if you want to uh, catch anything you missed. Uh, we're also getting them uploaded into podcasts. So you can go to Apple Podcasts and do a uh, virtual band director conference, and you can see right now our first five episodes. So 
Uh, go check those out and give us feedback. If you think it's horrible, be like, John, stop what you're doing. We'll change it, okay? Just let me know. <laughs> uh, and before I get out, I also want to thank Mr. Bennett Parsons. He is an extraordinaire in helping me make this thing run. Uh, so thank you, Bennett. And we're, we're going to get this thing with our last questions. Also comes from Facebook. Excuse me. It says, uh, for all my guests, except, or for all of the guests, except, especially for Mr. Russell, how do you recruit new students to a high school band program that has no musical experience or background? <laughs> <laughs> I, I laugh. It's, 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 um, it, it, it's, it's a weird process because, you know, we don't know where our kids are coming from or if they'll be interested in band or anything. Um, so the last couple years, it's kind of been, I show up and kids have been programmed into beginning band and I meet them on that first day. So I have not had to do any recruiting. Um, I would like to think that that's because of the reputation of the program rather than my administration throwing the kids into the room. But um, this year I had a general music class put on my schedule and it was a class of freshmen and I said okay well you guys are beginning band I gave them a list of options I said okay you can be a general music class I'll pull out the textbooks and we'll sit here and read and write and talk about music or we can be a guitar ensemble or we could be a beginning band I was really like guiding them towards that beginning band thing they became a beginning band but um in terms of getting out Ideally, I would like to, you know, create flyers and pamphlets and materials and go to the elementary schools and, you know, meet with the counselors who are making, you know, those decisions for students in terms of what courses you're going to be taking at the ninth grade level and, you know, develop Marcus, relationships with them. Marcus, what? can I stop you real quick? Yeah, hey, sure. Don't you have a jazz band that you take all over the city? Oh, yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot. Yeah. So, I mean, we perform enough in the community where people see, you know, what it is that we're doing and people, you know, students that I currently have are talking to students, you know, at the elementary schools and kids have siblings. So the word gets out about how great the band program is and how much fun the kids are having. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it's being done. <laughs> Cindy's showing off her animal. Yeah, down there um because it's it's time for that walk you know but um, you know what ninth grade beginners are a, a lot faster than sixth grade beginners i can tell you that right now so and you know if um i know in our situation where most of our kids start in sixth grade if a kid wants to start in ninth grade they really want to be in band true so and you know eighth grade beginners too a lot of the schools not a lot but many of the schools that I go to actually do have accommodations for seventh grade and eighth grade beginners. Mm -hmm. And I say, that's wonderful. Why not? You know, um, and if they, if they they can stick it out and, and go on, because really a seventh grade beginner can move a year and a half's worth, especially if you, if they're in lessons or, you know, whatever the situation is, but they can, they can just move faster. And so why not? I, I started saxophone uh, junior year of high school. Um, not too many people know when I actually started playing. Yep, junior year is when I started. You know, um, that's funny that you say that, but we have two wonderful teachers in our area. Darlene Janeski, who teaches at Fossil Hill. She started French horn in, I want to say, 10th grade. And she's a great singer. And the band director gave her the horn and said, here, go to that room and, you know, learn it. And I, she also plays piano. And she did it. And Anthony Rivera who is at Richland High School, started to be in 10th grade in San Antonio and went to WT, you know, so it can be done. Clearly you're making it work. This is so fascinating. I mean, this schedule that you have Marquise is just so foreign to <laughs> the people that I know that are on this screen for sure. So, but you know, it's whatever you have to do to make it work. That's really, it's great.